Bruchem Aboyim, thank you for coming. Uh, the topic tonight is on a uh, interesting mitzvah. That's not even one of the 613 commandments, but everything is based on it. It's the concept of humility. Um, it's one of the things that are under what's called the halakta bedrochav, which translates to mean to go in the ways of God. How do we know that humility is such a major concept to God? Everything that we do is basically predicated on the Torah, on the Bible. And what we find unusual is that the Torah begins with the word, Bereshis Baralokim, which translates literally to mean, in the beginning created God. And the commentaries ask the obvious question, it really just could have said, Elohim bara Bereshis, that God created the beginning. Because it really co co creates a question of some people might interpret it. In fact, when the Torah was first translated into Greek, they re changed it for that fear that someone would think Bereshis, beginning whoever that is, created God. But what we see is when the question is asked and the answer given as to why God put his name third, was for him to show us his humility. And if God is humble, who are we to have arrogance in any way, shape, or form? So we see that all that we do is really try to, trying to emulate God and to, in some way or form, some small way, to be godly by being what he is. Now, we see that the whole world says, Tola Eretz HaBalima. So it's a verse in, uh, based on the Gemara in uh, Chulin. Rabbi Yochanan says, which translates to mean that he spends the whole world upon nothingness. What is that nothingness? Humility. That that's what the whole world is based on. This concept of humility. The uh, Rabbi Shul ben Levi says that humility is the greatest trait of all, of all the traits that a person can have. Once a person is humble, everything comes from that. And a person it sets the order of things. In Yeshaya it says, I am with the contrite of lowly spirit. Again, God is always with someone who feels low in himself. And we say in the Shacharit prayer every day, he humbles the haughty to the ground and raises the lowly to supreme heights. Uh, again, and then it continues with Redeemer, redeems the humble. This concept is repeated again and again. In the Gemara in uh, Sota, based on a verse in Psalms in Tehillim, it says, Zivke Elohim Ruach Nishbara, that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. And what's interesting is it should be the sacrifice of God to God. And yet it's plural, the sacrifices. And the rabbis may tell us that if a person is humble, when he brings the sacrifice, it's as if he brought all the sacrifices. Just by bringing one, by having a humble spirit. Also, what uh, Martin Sanhedrin teaches us that a broken and crushed heart will not be despised by God. Which is interesting, but who is that said about? A murderer. That even a murderer that if he has a broken and crushed heart, that if he realizes the travesty of what he did, and he does true, true repentance, even he is accepted by God, as we know, that the first line that we say in the Pirkei Avot, of every Jew has a portion in the world to come, is a Gemara, from the Gemara in Sanhedrin, and that's said by a murderer. It's said by the head of the Jewish court to the murderer before he kills him. That if a person does tshuva, a person repents through great humility, this can change all of the negativity to positives. It's the, what's the opposite of humility? Ego. And the Rambam says that a person should take the middle road, except for two things. A person should never get angry, and a person should not have an ego. How does a person do that? Self-control. By having self-control, a person can learn humility. In fact, when we finish off the standing prayer three times a day, throughout the year, 365 days of the year, we say in the second line, that those that curse my soul, I should be inadamant to, totally silent. And my soul should be like dust to everyone. No one says that you have to answer everyone. No one says that you have to acknowledge every comment that a person makes to you. Person, other people shouldn't define who you are. 
that when a person tries to humiliate you, you can only be humili humiliated if you accept that. And there's no necessity to answer everything. Um, and there are many examples, as we see today, which I'm not going to get into, but that we see people in high positions that go after everything with the bazooka, that it's not necessary, you know, if a fly... And I guess the better example is in a sukkah, I'm, every year, it amazes me. Adults are sitting in a sukkah and there's a bee. And they get all freaked out. They're, they're running all over the place and they can't have their meal in peace. I refuse. If the bee's going to sting me, let him sting me. But I'm not going to show that much attention to a bee. And this becomes the key. Again, you know, I'm not going to give that type of acknowledgement to that. And not only that, we see that with Yaakov, that Yaakov became Yisro. What's the word Yaakov come from? The word Akev, which is heel. And the heel is the lowest part of the body. It's interesting that in English, it's also next to the sole of the foot. So what you have is an allusion to that, that when a person is humble, an Akev, a heel, that's where you can find a true soul, a true godliness. And the word Yisroel, that he was, he was given as he reached his pinnacle in life is from the Yashir Kel to be the straight one of God, just like the Rambam says, that a person should not go to the right or the left but take the middle path. And he found the proper path, and the proper path is humility. When it comes to a, a Nasi, a prince, who's a prince? And the word Nasi can be broken up into two words, Yesh and Ayan have and not have. If you think you're a somebody, a yesh, then you're an I and you're a nobody. But if you think you're a nobody, then you're a yesh and you're a somebody. And this, again, this concept of humility. But what, what's the definition of humility? Webster says it's someone who's not proud, not thinking of yourself as better than other people. Not everybody follows tennis, but there's a... Uh, a great tennis star. His name is Rafael Nadal. And uh, he's won 15 titles, 10, 10 French Opens, something that's unheard of. And the reason I'm mentioning him is his humility is amazing. He's not a Jew, but he was interviewed by someone, and the interviewer said to him, Rafael, when did you come to realize that you were special? And with complete honesty, he looked at the man and he said, I am not special. And I think that's the greatest attribute a person could have, to have that humility and not even know it. Just to have, to think of yourself as just someone who tries hard and pushes, and that's what he is. And that's what we all need to be. Even Moshe Rabbeinu. Torah says the one compliment of Moshe Rabbeinu was that he was Ish Anav Ma'od, the humblest of all people. Where did he learn it from? After all, Moshe Rabbeinu, as we know, we're all tested with some sort of test, some negativity that we have. His may well have been arrogance. Born as a prince, in the, brought up as a prince in the house of Paro. According to the Medjus, was the king of Ethiopia for 40 years, and then the king of the Jews. Ego comes with the position. And yet, Moshe Beno received, accepted the Torah from Sinai. He didn't receive it from Sinai, he received it from God. But what he saw from Sinai was the concept of humility was not the highest mountain, it was not the prettiest mountain. And God decided to bring, give the Torah on that mountain. Again, to teach us humility. But at the same time, humility doesn't mean meekness. Humility doesn't mean being a dish rag. Humility doesn't mean that you lay down and people walk over you. That's not humility. That's submissiveness. That's, that's subject, being subjected to things. I mean, there are different reasons why people have humility. A slave has humility. Poverty gives a person humility. But that's through oppression. That's through subjugation. Being a parent teaches you humility. When you think that you actually can be in control of something and you find out that you're really not, it teaches us humility. That's why a judge cannot be a judge unless he has children because that's where you learn true humility. Life experiences having a broken spirit, having realizing where you're at, and sometimes it's in the wrong direction, and you've moved in that direction so long 
that you realize how, what mistakes you've made. Sometimes it's by hurting someone that you really love and it coming back and that realization. Humility comes from an honest assessment of what you don't know. Also being in the presence of someone who is truly accomplished, overcoming great challenges, accomplishing great things. We had a dinner this week and there was a blind Supreme Court justice. A blind Supreme Court justice. The man became a lawyer and he's legally blind. And then he became a Supreme Court justice. But on top of that, this individual has run 18 marathons. On top of that, he has, run, he has been in the Ironman um, Uh, my, well, it's a event, I guess is the proper word. And in the Ironman event, what you have to do is you have to swim 2.3 miles, you have to bike 116 miles, and then a marathon for 26.2 miles without stopping, without stopping. And he described swimming with the rope so he would know where he was going and not being able to protect himself when people would kick him in the face because you don't know what's coming. And it really makes you humble because we, we complain about so many little things and we really are challenged and we don't realize just how, how much we can do. And when you're around a person like that, it humbles you to think that look at what he's able to do. Who really is the person who is challenged, us or him? Who is the person who is disabled? And it really is a realization of things. So Moshe Rabbeinu realized this when he looked and he saw that God gave this Torah to something that was lower, but not in the valley. And that's important. That humility doesn't mean, again, laying down and having people walk over you. At the same time, it does come from a broken spirit. There's a story told of the tailor of Lemberg. And the story goes that the, the tailor, the simple tailor in the town of Lemberg passed away. And to everyone's amazement, the rabbi of Lemberg was leading the procession of his funeral. And when people saw that the rabbi was leading the procession, then the town fathers came and everybody else saw that. The man was buried with great pomp and with great honor. But people didn't understand why. And they went to the rabbi and they asked him to explain. The rabbi said that many years ago he had spent a Shabbos at an inn in a small town. And while he was there, the innkeeper just before Shabbos was telling him about a Jewish tailor who had done work for the poets, for the landowner. And he was very talented in being able to be glib and funny, a jester, and also had a good voice. And he struck up a relationship with the Poritz's family and with the Poritz himself, so much so that the Poritz invited him to stay, and one thing led to another. And he became the jester of the Poritz, and his religiosity slept, sw just drifted away to the point where he was no longer observ observant at all. And the rabbi and the innkeeper were talking about it and lamenting it. And just before Shabbos began, there was a horse that galloped up to the inn. And the person that got off the horse looked like the ports himself, dressed very regally. And it was the jester. And he came in and told the innkeeper, I hear you have a, I have a great rabbi here. I'd like to be able to, to observe him for the Shabbos. So I'll have more material to jest about at the court. And amazingly, as the Shabbos continued, moved through and the rabbi spoke, he could tell the jester was not jesting anymore. He was listening and he was hearing how Abram Avinu's father Terach and Yishmael became Baal Tshuvas, and they repented and God accepted even their repentance. And by the time Shabbos was over, this tailor went to the rabbi with tears broken and said, what can he do to correct his life? And the rabbi told him to go to Lemberg and would go to the big synagogue there. And there he should go to the Shamus 
and spend every day locked up in the cabinet underneath the bima and not eat from all day, all day and then at the in the evening after the prayers the shama should let him out and this he should do every day of the week and break his fast with bread and water nothing more and that on Shabbos he can go home but he should do this week after week until he gets a sign from heaven that heaven has accepted his tshuva, his repentance for what he had done. And so he went to Lemberg and the rabbi said, this, this is the tailor. And he went to the bima and he was locked up every day and this went on week after week and every week the shamas would let him out every night and then for Shabbos itself. And while he was there he cried and said to Hillam and begged heaven to forgive him. And then one Arab Shabbos, just before Shabbos, the Shabbos forgot to let him out. And it got late, and he realized the Shabbos had for, forgotten about him. And his tears were even deeper, and his tshuva even greater. And then all of a sudden, he saw a vision. And in the vision, a man came to him, a saintly man. And the man introduced himself and said, I am Elio Anavi. I'm Elijah the priest. I'm here to tell you that your tshuva, your repentance has been accepted. The guy, you have broken yourself. You have humbled yourself to the point where not only has God accepted your tshuva, but I will be with you every night and teach you the deep mysteries of Torah every night for the rest of your life. And with that, the shamas came and let him out and apologized profusely. And he said that he had forgotten to let him out and he had gone to sleep. And, an, and a saintly looking man woke him up and told him to come take him out. And after that the tailor became a simple tailor in Lemberg. And he worked out of his house, mostly for the poor, and just taking enough money to live on. And the rabbi said, that one night as I passed his house, I saw there was a bright light in his house. And I went in and I saw that he was there working on something, on clothing, by a little candle. And I came by the following night. And again, I saw a bright light. And I came in and he was again working by the light of a candle. And on the third night, I finally said to him, what is this? What's the bright light? And he then acknowledged me and told me that every night early on Navi came and learned with him and that was the bright light. And he said that as long as he was alive, no individual in the town of Lemberg would die. And the rabbi said, I was amazed to hear that, but I didn't believe it. And I had the Hevri Kadesha, I had the burial society tell me if anyone died. And he said, up until today, no person in Lemberg has ever died except for people that have visited or have come through the town. And this is the reason why I walked behind this man's casket today for the great individual was, the person that acknowledged and had found out what true humility was. And when heaven sees that, heaven acknowledges it. And everyone benefits from people like them. May God bless us that we somehow, some way, it's interesting. It's the one mitzvah that if a person says, I'm going to be humble, you are no longer humble. It's something that a person works on and achieves quite by accident. And the more you think of yourself, the less it is. The key becomes to learn the one thing that humility is for, for about. That when you realize there's a God in the world, how can you have arrogance? No matter what you do, it's, it pales in comparison to God. And that's the real essence. If you acknowledge there's a God in the world, you can only be humble and pray that you can come closer to him and some of the and to some of God's greatness. Again, thank you for coming. May God bless you all. Have a good Shabbos.